So what I'm going to do in this video is just take you through how you can create quick applications using ChatGPT. So to create the code, specifically GPT-4, because it's far more reliable in this case. And you can take that code and then turn that into an application. So it's just trying to demystify that process of going from code to application, which is often the tricky bit. Um, tools that have come across along now that make this mega easy. The one we're going to be using is called Replit, which is amazing. Takes loads of the hassle out of actually creating a public application from what you've uh, created with the code. And the specific example I'm going to do here is actually a problem that I had. So I had a huge Excel file um, with over a million rows. Every time I tried to remove the blank rows from it, it crashed my computer. What I could have done is gone and found something online to do that, but you don't know whether they're going to work. You don't know whether you're going to get spam. You have to sign up for X, Y, Z. But the reality is you can actually just create little applications to do these things for you now, and then it can do it for you for free forever. So Replit is free as well, by the way. So what we'll start off by doing is just putting a prompt into ChatGPT and there's a bit of what you call prompt engineering in here in the sense of I know what it does, make, how it makes mistakes. So you're trying to be really explicit about what it does. I'm saying it works in Replit because then it will tailor it for that and for running applications in Replit because it understands what that looks like. Um, should have a user interface being explicit about that so that you can upload a CSV file, exactly what it does. Um, which row it should look at because it might miss that if you don't say and you don't specify. I'm also talking about running in web view in Replit because sometimes it will create an application that doesn't have a user interface and then you'd have to run it in the command line, but we want a user interface to actually be able to do it. So give the full application files and then this is just, it can be lazy sometimes, which is a strange phenomenon, but it doesn't give you the full code. So putting this helps to ensure that it gives you the full code. So if I just run that now, I'll start creating the application. It's often created in Python. I think that's to do with the training data, but it works well in Replit, so that's ideal. It makes a funny mistake here straight away. So app.py, that's the main file. Um, all of this might look a bit complicated by the way, but it really isn't. Like there's a lot of the complexities just not gonna come about. So just to give the heads up on that. Um, the app.py, it actually should be main.py, and uh, that works better in Replit out of the box, so you don't have to do any other configuration. So I'll show you that when I set up in Replit. So we've got the main file, and then we've got the um, UI, user interface. So let's just take that, and what you've, I've got one here, but what you would be doing in Replit is you'd just be creating, and then create Python. So you just need to, once you've got your account in Replit, which is free, just go and create and then Python. So you know the programming language because it's told us here. So this is one I was playing around with earlier, which I should have deleted. So let's just delete this out. So this is exactly the same as what you would see. So what you'd be met with is a blank sort of user interface here to create your application and you'd have this main.py file. So we copy that across. From there, as you can see, and that's going into the root directory, which is just, that will already exist, that file, so you don't need to do anything. And then it's saying, what we also need to do is do this, but you don't actually have to do that because Replit takes care of that. So that's something called the, um, the packages dependencies, and that's just to enable the application to run, but Replit takes care of that, and hence why it's a great tool for building these to take that away. So it's saying I need a templates folder because a template is where you keep public facing files for Python applications. And it's saying this is my HTML that I need to put in. So it's called upload.html. And that's the user interface which will make it look a little bit nicer in a moment as well. But let's just run that to begin with. That won't be on, so. OK, 
Okay, so that's it. We've got our user interface that's loaded now. And if I pick a file, which I've already done, and I just run that, if I just open that now, and that's processed. And as you can see how instant that was. So one of the benefits of these kind of applications is they're just really light and do one thing. So it's absolutely instant in terms of processing. Now what this web view is though, is basically just a browser window. So if I go up to here now, that's your application public. You could, you could give someone that URL. You can set that to your own domain. So you could have your own application running and that's it. You've got your public facing application that works really nicely. Um, so you can be a lot more ambitious than me with what you're actually creating. But that's the sort of groundwork, as you can see, as I say, removing all of the rows there. So let's make it look a little bit nicer. So that's just really basic. There's no uh, CSS. And um, one thing I do with the design is I just ask for material design. So update my UI to use material design, which is a design language. Contain the UI elements in a white container with a drop shadow and a light blue background. Give the container rounded edges. Okay, so it's given us that now. And all we're gonna do is put that into the user interface, which is in templates, upload.html, rerun it. And that's your nice design now. So let's upload a file. Oops. Okay, it's not brilliant. You'd have to play around with it, but there you go. You've got your user interface. I'm not sure about that funky styling. That's where you get into looking at telling it that you've got a problem with it and revamping it, redoing it, telling it which element is incorrect through natural language. Just say the button to upload. The button to select a file is incorrect, blah, blah. One thing to note is um, what you're going to come across a lot with just playing around with these things is some things probably go goes wrong. So what you've got is a, this will, I think, always run automatically. Um, I've just deleted something that doesn't mess it up. This doesn't always run automatically. So at the console, sorry, it should run automatically, but if it doesn't, you just need to go to console here and then you can pick it up. And what you need to do is just take that error because you can see that that's error. there's been an error there and it's not running. So take that and then copy it into GPT and just say, and then wait for it to rewrite what the problem is. Go through that cycle, put it in here, fix it, and then you'll get it working. And it takes a lot of iterations sometimes, but you'll get it working and it can do it for really complicated applications. So just look at that console, look at what's being logged there. And there's more you can do around logging and telling GPT to log things. So you can put logging in your code so it identifies the errors, but that's a bit more for another time. Hopefully that's helped. Any questions, just give me a shout and I'll put the prompt in the comments so that you can sort of tailor it for your own solution. Cheers. Bye-bye.